Your thoughts on Alex Salmon's um, sudden and, and really quite shocking, I think, um, whether you liked him or not, we heard of his death last night. Yes, and I think it kind of a reflection of the the length and duration of his important career. Most of his work predates my my entry into politics, but I don't think anyone could deny that he was a, a totemic figure in in Scottish politics. And I don't support Scottish independence. That doesn't mean that I don't recognise uh, that what he did to, to bring that advance that cause. And you know, you talk about great politicians. If you really believe in something, can you manage to persuade uh, a lot of people to get behind your cause, even if you weren't ultimately successful? You need you need credit for that and I, I'm sure Scottish politics will be uh, mourning his loss as this huge figure and contributed to Scottish politics over many many years. He was quite unique because he was a uh, I think he would admit to this a divisive uh, character in politics obviously over a hugely central theme the union um, uh, of Great Britain and Northern Ireland he wanted independence uh, that's no no great secret but many people whilst they would have disagreed with him and ultimately, the nation of Scotland disagreed with him in a referendum. Fact was, he was he was liked as an individual, and even in Westminster, because he spent many years in Westminster. Yes, he, he, one of those politicians that's able to cut through and just have the public get 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 a true sense of who they are and believe, even if they don't agree with them, that they're, that's someone who's doing the right thing and, and sticking to his guns about something that he believes in. It's not easy, actually. Uh, you know, when you're in politics, a lot of politics draws you away from that, the sense that people think that you're relatable. Um, I think he never lost that that sense that he was a relatable figure and, and that is a big thing in politics. Let's turn, if I may. Uh, tonight there's a, a big shindig at uh, the Marlborough House on the Mall where the great and the good, the bankers particularly, the, the venture capitalist funds, all of it, they're going to be coming together along with big business as part of uh, the invitation from the Prime Minister to have an uh, investment summit, which is formally taking place tomorrow at the Guildhall. Um, it's hard to disagree with the idea that getting people to invest in Britain is a good idea. I'm sure, you know, you, you probably wouldn't come out and say this is a bad idea. But Given the furor over the transport secretary, Louise Haig, uh, describing one of uh, the, the, the United Kingdom's biggest investors, Dubai Ports and, and its company-owned P&O, um, uh, uh, calling for a boycott on P&O for their hire and fire practices, which I think most people disagree with, it's got off to a shaky start. What does that say about the government... And also, what does it say about the prospects for this investment summit? Well, I think the first thing to say is that, you know, it's a clear demonstration. The fact this event is so well attended, actually, uh, these big companies don't make investment decisions over a matter of, you know, weeks and months since Labour got in. This is actually just a continuation of the very strong position they inherited from the Conservative government. We were the top destination for foreign direct investment in recent years in, in Europe. Because of the framework we put up with our economy, people wanted to come and invest here. This investment summit will just be a continuation of that work. It shows really, as I said, that Labour try and paint this very bleak picture that they've inherited. There isn't a bleak picture when it comes to foreign direct investment. We've been a great position. And I think the the, the mishap over the P&O ferries and, and the investment that they seem to have managed to rescue, thank goodness, just shows, as the person I'm supporting in the leadership, Kemi Badenoch, uh, says, they're not serious. You know, they're not a serious party of, of government. You have one part of the government inviting somebody to an investment summit at the same time as another part of government um, is criticising them. There will be times as a government you have to criticise companies, whether they're investing or not. But you have to think that through very carefully, be clear that everyone is on the same page in government when you do that, and make sure it's a reasonable and fair criticism. Um, and I really think they've just shown that they're not they're not operating Kieran, as they should. Do, do, do you think, though, that um, they've been out of office for uh, however many years it is, 13, 14 years, that it's inevitable that they can't shake off what it's like being an opposition party where you can criticize everything say anything without consequences shouldn't we cut them a bit of slack and say you know what these are teething problems not particularly i mean i think yeah first of all they have a number of people in the in the current government who've got government experience uh keir starmer likes to talk all the time about the fact he was in charge of a significant organization the cps and actually i, I think this sort of gaffe is, is this isn't minutiae this is you know big announcement being made by the secretary of state for transport surely someone's got to go through that and check exactly what they're going to say at the same time as they've got an investment summit 
I, I think this is this is basic stuff. This is, this is not teething problems. This is core basic stuff that you've got to get right from day one. I was struck by what I think is a, a contradiction. Uh, Elon Musk, Tesla, the entrepreneur, who everything from space to cars, you name it. Very uh, controversial figure to some, but you can't doubt his business expertise and, uh, 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 and so forth. He was very critical of the government over the handling of the riots in the summer. He has not been invited, yet the owner of P&O Ferries have, who were criticised by this government particularly. Um, you know, what's going on here? Because that strikes me as a little bit hypocritical double standards. It's just recognising that you know, governing is extremely difficult. And I think what we, um, the, the difficulty of the last election is people uh, kind of took for granted that Labour were going to come in and just do some of this stuff better. And instead of realising actually this stuff is hard to get right, we weren't perfect. And, and you know, clearly we have to reflect on the mistakes that we made. But it just, you, you can't just mouth off because you're, you don't like something and you can't just criticise somebody because you feel like it. There's a lot of stuff going on with government with people who are investing in the country, not just uh, companies, but foreign countries. There's often foreign countries that we have very complex relationships with where, you know, we might not be happy with everything that they do. And we do have to find space to criticise them. But you've got to do it in a, in a thought through way that maintains relationships. Well, let me... And uh, sorry, Kieran, to, uh, to cut you off there. Let me let me just ask you one final question and be a little bit critical of you, if I may, here, or, or your party, rather, uh, than you specifically. Um, a lot of investment talk is around transport, infrastructure. We all know how important that is. Um, you know, under 14 years uh, of power with the Conservatives, why is the transport network still pretty diabolical in this country, from potholes in our roads, uh, uh, train services taken out of privatisation and put into la uh, measures of last resort, nationalisation, um, our airports are struggling on capacity. I mean, this is all, all come about after 14 years of Conservative government. Well, I think this. You've got to look at the positives to start with. When it comes to rail, for example, the entire time that Labour and government before us, they electrified 63 miles of track. We electrified more than a thousand miles of track. We invested record amounts in actually in, in infrastructure in, in the railways. Uh, COVID, I'm afraid, did play a big part when it comes to railways and buses, for example. We spent enormous amounts of money during COVID, much more than, than we had planned to invest just to keep those services going. People probably remember back to COVID, seeing empty buses going around towns, empty trains up and down the tracks. That cost an enormous amount of money and, and has had to reset our, our transport network on road and rail. And I think we were starting the journey of thinking differently about how we do that on roads. I see locally as an MP that there is an, an enormous challenge in local government that increasing amounts of local uh, government spending, which traditionally looks after the vast majority of our road network, is going on social care and uh, special needs education support for, for children. We didn't crack that 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 kind of increasing pressure on on social services um, and the, and the impact that had on the rest of of local government spending. I accept we didn't crack that, but I'm afraid there are not easy answers on that. We did pass a bill on social care funding and to bring in a cap and try and generate an insurance market and Labour are now going back to square one. You know, it's very hard for us to get that through Parliament. You, you'll know, you've followed politics for a long time. Social care for decades has been a thing that one party tries to do, the other party criticises and nothing happens. We did pass a new law on social care. They've dumped it and are starting from scratch again. I'm not quite sure how we got from transport to social care, but it was very neatly done. It's, it's critical. It's critical because that, they pay for the road networks, the same government. Kieran, Kieran, if I may, um, I'm going to draw it to an end there. I'm very grateful to you joining us here on Sunday morning. Kieran Mullen, MP, Shadow Transport Secretary uh, for the opposition. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Now, um, I'm talking. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about Alex Salmon in a minute to John Boothman. He's the political correspondent of the Sunday Times in Scotland. But just to remind you, people are calling Alex Salmon great. Some are saying a titan, but the word great is also bandied around. And I'm asking you, I'd love your thoughts on what makes a politician great. 0344 four, double nine one thousand. People said the same of Margaret Thatcher. Why? They also say the same about Nigel Farage. Is there something in common there? 0344 four, double nine one thousand. Now, as you will all uh, be keenly aware of, Alex Salmon, uh, former leader of the SNP uh, at the time of the referendum and, of course, leader of the Albia party, 
um, dies suddenly uh, yesterday, age 69, a relatively uh, young age and completely unexpected. Lots of tributes being paid um, and lots of thoughts being shared this morning. I'm very pleased to welcome John Boothman, a man who knows uh, politics in Scotland rather well, political correspondent for the Sunday Times in Scotland. John, welcome. How are you doing, Nick? I'm doing very well. Would, is it fair? Lots of papers are calling Alex Salmon the Titan uh, today, including, I think, The Times uh, came up with that headline. Um, uh, was he, w w is that a fair description? And what made him a Titan? What made him great? I think you're talking about what makes a politician great. And Alex Salmon, I think, does fall into that category. He changed the political direction of the country, the country that he led. He made, I suppose, as one correspondent in the Sunday Times has said this morning, the unthinkable thinkable. And what I mean by that is he turned independence from being something on the fringes of politics to really a concrete possibility. And he has transcended politics in Scotland and at a wider level he's been well known in the UK and internationally too. Um, in the period that he was in charge, he was uh, hugely popular, at least with half of the population as we saw uh, in 2014. But, you know, after that, um, after he left the leadership and for a variety of reasons, things started to go awry. He, he was an interesting character because it's been written about this morning. He did really drag the SNP into a, a party of significance, didn't he? Because up until he became leader, they were, they were a, a fringe might be a bit harsh, but they were pretty much on the fringes of politics in those days in a landscape dominated by Labour. So Alex Salmond was the leader of the SNP twice, from 1990 to 2000. Um, during that period he started, the SNP had six MPs. When he left, uh, they were the second biggest party in Scotland at uh, that Scottish election in 1999. Um, he went to Westminster, he came back four years later, and his big success, his big success was electoral success. Alex Salmond won the Scottish elections to Holyrood in 2007. Nobody expected that to happen. And then he did what was regarded as being impossible in a PR parliament. He won a majority in 2011. And on the basis of that, he negotiated with David Cameron. And we had that referendum in 2014. Now, depending on who you are, um, that referendum was very close, the nationalist side would say, but I think in reality there was 400,000 of a difference in the vote, 2 million plus against 1.6 million. Actually, it was a pretty decisive victory, but given where that had come from, um, only I think when the referendum was agreed in January 2012, uh, only a third of Scots supported independence. He actually, you know, uh, gave that cause a big boost uh, after the referendum itself. Um, because of that in 2014, all of the other parties were virtually wiped out in the general election and Salmond uh, uh, successor, Nicola Sturgeon, won 56 of the 59 seats. Do you think, just a final question, looking ahead, which uh, this may be premature, so forgive me, but do you think the Alba party was very dependent on um, Alex Salmond and, and its future. It, it, may, it may not, if you like, be, but remain the force such as it is now. Well, to be honest, Nick, it wasn't really very much of a force. It was formed in February 2021. Um, since then, it's never won a seat in Scotland, either at a Westminster level or Holyrood level. It couldn't even win a single seat um, when there were 1,200 local authority seats up for grabs in the last council elections. So it's a party that's been in the doldrums. He's been the dominant party in it. It's been doing relatively well in the polls. They might have won a few seats in 2026 at the next Holyrood elections, but one wonders with the passing of Alex Salmond whether the party itself will ever manage to get really on its feet and win anything at all. John, thank you for joining us this morning to talk about Alex Salmond. John Boothman, political correspondent, The Sunday Times uh, in Scotland. Was Alex Salmond a great politician? He clearly made a huge impact 
on politics in the UK and in Scotland.